Welcome parents to the Edumaker Voices Parents Webinar, co-hosted by BEO and the CTF Education Group. I'm Jennifer Ma, Group Chief Strategy Officer of CTFEG. As your K-12 education partner, CTFEG is dedicated to connecting you with the leaders and experts driving K-12 education innovation in the region, to provide you with the resources and insights you need to pave your children's education journey. Last October, we launched the Education Maker Voices, a new campaign focused on navigating school transitions, parenting for the future, and empowering student-centered learning. To date, we have hosted many events and thank you all for your participation. So what is Edumaker? Let's watch the video and see what's our underlying ethos. We are the makers. We make life fun. We make math. We make dreams come true. We make every day count. We make risk-taking moves. We make discoveries. We make a difference. We make the impossible possible. Makers. We make an impact on the future through education. CTF Education Group. Needless to say, the pandemic has created dramatic disruptions to our daily life, especially impacting our children. Whilst there has been a relatively effective shift from learning in the classroom to online, it has inevitably presented a substantial change in learning routines and mindsets. As CTF EG and as educators, we are aware of the inevitable learning gaps. And the question is, how can we catch up with time and address these gaps? In today's webinar, experts from different fields will talk about the effective and unique learning experiences, especially applicable in this post-COVID era. First, Dr. Richard Wong, Academic Director, Early Childhood of CTFEG and Academic Advisor of BEO, will share the challenges of the pandemic and the impact on children's education and development. Then it is our honor to invite three guest speakers, Demi Su, the first violin member from Hong Kong Philharmonic Orchestra, Joe Chung, Director of Art Loop, and Albert Ma, Director of Education Services, Academic and Enrichment of Art Education, to share how carefully created <coughs> interdisciplinary learning experiences involving music, art, literacy and community outreach could be an effective and efficient way to stimulate children's learning and interests. Lastly, don't miss the Q&A session. We will answer the questions collected from registration process. And we also welcome you to submit questions throughout the whole webinar um, in Zoom Q&A box. Now let's welcome Dr. Wong. Good morning, parents. I'm Richard. Today, I'm going to share with you my ideas related to unique learning methods in the post-COVID era. So, I've got two ideas to share with you. Uh, so, next slide. Yep, so today I'm going to cover two main areas. So, uh, area number one is, well, first, what the children have indeed learned, have indeed lost learning opportunities. And then second, how best what children's learning, especially after four such with you. So uh, COVID has been around since 2019 and for some parents they are quite worried because they think that children who are aged zero and six belong to a lost generation in the sense that their learning environments, their growing up environment from, from what we are used to. So for example, uh, well in the past three years there has been a mixture of online learning and face-to-face -face learning. And secondly, when children go out, uh, most of the time, 
you see the masked faces of people. Sometimes you will notice that uh, when you uh, will see people without a mask, you will find that they look quite different. And thirdly, while well, children are scientists, they like to touch things. During COVID, uh, well, they're not able to So the question is, the question is, do they really belong to a lost generation? So to answer this question, I've done some research. So next slide. So I've actually uh, created the table. So um, if you look at some particular areas, so for example, the uh, quantity of the time and, uh, and also the uh, amount of time available uh, for young children to interact with other children and, and also the outdoor time. So when you look at these areas, well, the experience may not be that positive, okay? When you look at some other areas, so for example, the quality of the interaction between children and the adults, well, the situation may not be that bad because I noticed that in some schools, uh, they actually arrange small group Zoom sessions for young children. So actually, the quality of the interaction between children and the adults may have may have, been, um, may have maintained or even improved. And also, uh, well, for parents, uh, well, a lot of parents were, st uh, were spending more time at home, so they were able to spend more time uh, interacting with children. So actually, quality of the interactions between children and the parents, well, in a way, depends uh, depends on the parenting skills of the, uh, the parenting skills. And um, and also, I've noticed that uh, well, during my observations uh, on uh, well on Zoom sessions, I noticed, that, I noticed that for some children. They are actually quite uh, well um, tech savvy in the sense that they know how to mute themselves, unmute themselves, and also children know how to uh, change the different backgrounds. So actually, children are quite resilient. But most importantly, most importantly, uh, what I think is priceless is that children do not take things granted anymore. What is special is that our uh, children treasure the time that they spend at school with friends and with their teachers, and this is us. Because when they see that, uh, well, something is very, very, very precious, then, uh, well, they will, they will pay more attention. And, and also they will devote more of themselves. So next slide. So what we have learned from the experience is that um, whether we have, uh, we see lost opportunities or, um, well, in a way, really, it really depends on the uh, on the areas that we're focusing on. Are we talking about quantity or are we talking about quality? And also, whether the experience has been positive or not depends on the choices that we have made. So, uh, so for example, when the quantity of instruction time has decreased, what we can do is that we can improve the quality. And also, our mindset changes the way we interact with our children. So for example, uh, well, children are not able to touch a lot of things. Well, uh, we can be more selective. We can arrange other opportunities in which children can interact with physical materials in a more controlled and safe setting. Finally, uh, well, the third important point or conclusion that I, uh, I've drawn from, um, from my observations is that children are actually much more, much more resilient than we think. Uh, so for example, uh, well, um, for example, in the past, uh, well, from January to, to April, April, a lot of parents were worried worried that uh, well, the children, well, they were spending a lot of time uh, doing some uh, some learning. What would happen? What would happen to them when they were back to school uh, in, in May? So what I've noticed uh, is that well, children didn't have issues at all. They were able to interact with their classmates using very very fluent language. So so actually, children are much more resilient than we think. Right. And based on my observations, uh, well, over the past three um, years, uh, I've got some concrete suggestions uh, for you relating to, well, how best to support learning in the COVID era or post-COVID era. So uh, idea number one is, well, the quantity of instruction time may have decreased, so we can actually focus on quality. So it's very important to make sure that what the children are learning next based on what they have learned earlier. So that's really, really important. It's important to make sure that everything is connected, linked to their life experience. And secondly, uh, well, since, since children cannot do everything, so we have to be very, very selective. We 
be very, very smart without voices. And then third, and uh, idea number three, idea number three is that children's resilience level is linked with their physical well-being. So making time available for physical activities is very, very crucial. Finally, children's well-being it's linked with their self-care skills. So I'm going to I will go over uh, with you some of the uh, my ideas about self-care skills. So next. So, uh, well, suggestion number one, to improve quality. So spiral learning is very important. So what does spiral learning mean? Means, um, what does it mean? So basically it means that what children are learning next based on what they have learned earlier. So it's like a spiral, it's like a spiral going up, okay? And I'm going to uh, use an example uh, to illustrate that on uh, this slide. Yep, so uh, well, uh, um, on this slide, what you can see, uh, what, what you can see is, uh, for example, after you have shared a story, uh, for example, uh, with the three little pigs, uh, what you can do next is to act out the story or drama. So once the children are very familiar with the content of the story, do the drama so that the, uh, the children will do the action, they will, uh, well, they will uh, say the lines. And after having done the drama, what you can do next is to uh, well, do something about the drama. You can uh, well, create an alternative version of the drama. For example, you can do a puppet show. Yeah, and, and next, what you can do next uh, is that uh, well, uh, the story is about building houses. Right. So what you can do with your child is that you can create models uh, of houses. For example, uh, where some houses are made of Lego, some houses are made of uh, twigs, etc. And you can test the strengths of the model. Okay. Next slide. So here uh, I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm going to show you a video. What is special is that uh, well during the period of online learning, uh, our students that were learning about the field. So when they were school then they were doing a drama so let's watch the video <laughs> Yeah, uh, so what you can see, what you can see is that uh, well, um, the children were learning about the three little pigs during the period of online learning. And then once they were back at school, then uh, well, they were doing drama and you can see the children were really enjoying themselves. So uh, another way to improve quality is to make sure that uh, you link the children's learning to their life experience. So here, here you can see that uh, you can see uh, well, a book created by our K3, uh, created by one of our K3 children. So uh, the child uh, created a book about uh, how to make fried rice. And the book is dedicated to, uh, to his mom. And the book is about how to make fried rice. Next. So here, uh, well, the child, the child uh, will be sharing with you the, uh, well, the tools or ingredients that are needed in order to make fried rice. So for example, uh, well, you need uh, a carrot and you need to peel it and you need, you need to chop it up. And at the same time, you need to be very, very careful. Otherwise, you will hurt yourself. yourself. So next slide. Yeah. And then afterwards, you need to wash. The uh, well, the carrot pieces, and then uh, and then afterwards, you need to put on uh, the um, uh, the, the carrots and the other ingredients. Uh, for example, uh, for example, six eggs, <laughs> oil, and some rice into the wok, and then you uh, stir fry it. So it's really amazing, and I'm sure that um, the the mother of the child would be very very happy. So what you can see is that in order to improve the uh, quality. It's very important to focus on two things. First of all, it's important to make sure that what the children are learning next is related to what they have learned earlier. Okay, so a solid foundation foundation for the next stage. And secondly, it's very important to make sure that all the learning components are interconnected. They need to be connected to life experience. So uh, next slide. 
Yeah, so idea number two, since children, since children are not able to touch everything, so we need to be very smart with our choices. We need to be more selective. So, uh, so uh, I'm going to show you a video and uh, it's quite cute. So what's happening is that the parents are, or the families are having a competition. So the parents and the child are rolling up a string uh, while using a roller. And then the string, the piece of string, uh, will, will um, go through the mouth of the doll. And, and so when you're rolling up the string, uh, then it really looks like the doll, the doll uh, is eating the noodles. So let's watch the video. Yep, next slide. Yep. So, uh, well, so apart from having a kind of competitions, you can also make your uh, you can also make your own toys. So, since children are spending more time at home, so uh, well they can spend time making their art objects. So let's watch the video. <laughs> Yeah, so children uh, well, can spend hours watching their own art objects, and also when they're bored, they will, they will be the scientists and, and then they will explore well, what else they can do with the art object. So next slide. Yep, and choosing educational toys is really, really important for, for young children. So here you can see that uh, well, there is a, a scale and, uh, and children are actually fascinated by, by the scale because uh, well, by putting a different objects on different sides, on different sides, on different sides, you will find that wow, the this, well, the balance uh, well, has changed. So uh, this is very, very important for their scientific uh, development. Next slide. Yep, and next slide. Finally, finally, uh, well, um, there was the uh, Chinese Culture Week. Uh, in our organization last week and before the uh, World Culture Week, our uh, children actually created this model. And, and can you see what the model is about? This is the, the Great War, uh, the Great War uh, of China. So uh, next slide. Yeah, so idea number three is that, uh, well, since children's resilience level is related to uh, their physical well-being, so spending time doing physical activities really really important so let's watch the videos the video Yep, uh, next slide. So, uh, well, apart from doing physical activities, support technology, of course, what you can do, what you should do is to, uh, well, you are to go, uh, to go to the site with, uh, with your children, with your child. And then what you can do is to compare the, the experiences, the experience with the support of technology and the experience physical activities without the support of, without the support of uh, technology. Uh, next slide. So finally, uh, well, idea number four is children's well-being is related to their self-care skills. And when it comes to self-care skills, usually we think we we think in terms of whether children are able to uh, well um, button up and or unbutton their their sweater or shirts. But actually, we need to move away from do a lot more with our both skills. So next slide. What I would advise parents to do is to uh, create a self-care plan. So some part of the plan is about the body. Some part of the plan is about the mind. Some part of the body is about the parts of your feelings. What can you do in order in order to make yourself feel better? For example, uh, okay, you can spend more time uh, while doing things that you like to do. And when it comes to the body, you can do more exercise, etc. So create a route create a set of routines for your children is really, really important. So next slide. So 
people to, to conclude whether, um, well, whether there are lots of opportunities or new opportunities, it depend, well, depends on our mindset. We may not be able to control this whole environment, but we can control our mindsets. So thank you very much. And I'm going to hand over to Gemma. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wong. Um, I think Dr. Wong has covered quite a few key concepts, including spiral learning. Uh, how do you build experiences upon previous experiences uh, for students learning and also linking learning to real life experiences and the importance of physical well-being. So in the coming section, I will actually talk more about um, how through a program that we have established called the Aspire program, targeting students age four to seven, how we can actually through um, a curated experience enhance the learning context, uh, which is you know, part of the spiral learning. Um, how, do, how do we build confidence? Uh, because a lot of our children uh, over the past few years have had uh, less interactions with peers um, and, um, and in a few months or even a year's time, they will have to go for interviews. So how do they actually present themselves um, at these school interviews? And lastly, um, community. So the self-care and, um, and emotional awareness is not just self-related, but how do they relate to the community, which has also been an experience deprived over the past few years. Um, so please, can we move on to my section of the PowerPoint? Okay, so um, there are six areas of key early childhood learning um, uh, aspects, being literacy, so we are English, um, Chinese for Hong Kong students, uh, social emotional, uh, numeracy, uh, music, art and gross motor skills, which is often uh, trained through sports. Next. Today, we'll be focusing on literacy, social emotional, music and art, uh, because these are uh, interrelated. Can we please move to the next slide? Uh, they, are, they form the basis of expression. Uh, they are interdisciplinary, they can be connected, and also it matters how we give them the exposure. So um, during the COVID uh, uh, period, especially during uh, work from home, uh, lockdown period, uh, I think for all these different areas, as parents, we have tried to enhance or keep up their learning. In literacy, uh, I'm sure children are doing some reading, they're doing some writing at home, and, uh, and a lot of being spoken to, such as parents reading uh, to children. So what is the gap that we would like to um, enhance? In social emotional, the biggest challenge is that they've been working from home. And as Dr. Wall had mentioned, they have uh, grown in confidence, uh, you know, working with adults, communicating with adults. But actually, in many settings, especially in the coming few years of development, they actually have to work with peer. And beyond just self with others, what about beyond their community, beyond their classroom? Uh, social emotional, a lot of times we talk about empathy. Um, are you able to connect? with other parts of the community. So in the past, maybe we'll go for flag selling, we'll bring them to see um, uh, uh, different parts of Hong Kong and look at different community uh, settings. But over the past few years of COVID, of course, that experience has also been diminished. Music, I'm sure, um, uh, sorry, I think the, the boxes are, um, I switched it here. But for music, I think a lot of children at home would be exposed to Disney or even basic instruments um, uh, like piano, violin, flute, friends. But actually, um, before the age of five and six, they may have to choose their own musical instrument. And without the exposure to concerts or actually seeing these different instruments, how do they actually choose? With music then, uh, with, with art, um, at home, they may be doing a lot of painting, but oftentimes it's probably uh, restricted to 2D type of artwork. And uh, what else should they do now to actually get them out of their comfort zone? Um, one key observation that we have seen in early childhood education is that students are a lot more uh, wary and concerned about hygiene, which is super important, especially during COVID. But to the extent that they actually do uh, are a little bit less um, risk-taking and less willing to try to work with different mediums. So in the later few um, uh, slides, we'll talk about how do we uh, curate experiences that are efficient, basically don't need to take a lot more time, but also effective in linking these learning. Next page, please. P 
So uh, one program that we had very successfully uh, launched uh, last two months is the Aspire Music and Art Extravaganza. And um, let's see how we enhance the learning context and build children's confidence and um, also uh, expose them to different parts of the community through this program. Next. So um, the program uh, lasted six lessons and every two lessons they got exposure to different genres of music. So first with theatre, they went through Aladdin and Cats, um, classical music, they, uh, we went through Vivaldi's uh, Four Seasons, um, and lastly, Aboriginal music, um, so that they can get exposure to African music, Latin American music, and even um, some Australian um, native music. And through this, uh, these six sessions, um, students actually had exposure to more than 20 plus um, orchestral instruments. And the instrumentalists, uh, we're very honored to have Hong Kong Philharmonic um, and uh, an expert group in Aboriginal music come to perform live uh, with our students. Next page. So what do we mean by actually having um, uh, 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 an effective and efficient uh, learning experiences? I'm sure a lot of students now, they may do piano and they dedicate one or two hours uh, a week to piano lessons. But this is also one hour per week. But over a few lessons, they had exposure to this many instrument types. Um, next page. And these are all close up um, co uh, connection with these instrumentalists. Students not just get to hear individual instruments, but they get to touch, they get to experiment with some of these um, uh, ways of playing these instruments. Of course, they were not the ones playing, but they could see, oh, actually bassoon, there are lots of buttons and a uh, harp is actually made of strings. And that kind of physical um, exposure and uh, experience was actually very um, eye-opening for these children. And when you go to see concerts, you may hear a lot of great music, but they can't really discern how each instrument may sound. So this way, um, it was a very unique experience. Next. And because they were looking at many different instruments, some of them looked alike. So they would, they would see a double bass, they would see a violin, a viola, um, a cello. So they could actually see how these in instruments were from the same family, but how from different um, design, they could make different types of sounds. So it got them a lot more reflective of how music came about with a different design of these instruments. Next page. Um, and we didn't just, you know, lecture, talk to them, but actually um, demonstrate it. So, for example, uh, a lot of kids may have come across flute, but uh, when it comes to the piccolo, um, the, 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 the tone range is completely different. So when we teach students uh, about these musical elements, tone, uh, pace, or, um, you know, uh, uh, how, they, how do these different musical instruments sound, it's actually quite effective for us to use different instruments to demonstrate the musicality. So let's just take a look at um, the piccolo. Yeah, so the students actually were like, oh, this actually sounded a lot more sharp, a lot higher pitch than a general uh, flute. Um, then the next thing here we see actually, uh, we demonstrating to students how these musical instruments came about in history. So, um, so this gentleman here also from Hong Kong Philharmonic actually brought with him five um, instruments that relate to the French horn. So from actually performing on a whelk, um, to performing on a on a on a horn um, on an antelope horn, to uh, to showing how it actually can be made through um, a, a toilet uh, um, uh, um, kind of tube, um, to actually showing how the French horn came about. The students really saw how history developed in making these instruments and really got them to appreciate how these sounds came about. Can we just play the three videos? from the whelk to the antelope horn to the French horn. So this is how we enrich the learning context. It's not just learning about the instrument, but learning about how they came about and how they dif differentiate from each other. Um, next page. And again, uh, we also included a lot of ensemble uh, music performances. 
Um, and I think this is very important because now that they have understood each instrument's um, uh, individual characteristics, how do they together make music? And uh, we show them how music can create different moods um, and different uh, uh, storytelling through music. So can you play this video? Um, so actually classical music uh, is, is oftentimes played even in Disney music, but oftentimes students do not hear this background music. They are very focused on the story or the visuals. So it's actually interesting for them to see, oh, actually a lot of the music that's background music is actually carefully curated by instrumentalists. Next page. Um, of course, we really want the students to not just be, be aware of orchestral music, but actually understand uh, culture and appreciate the arts and culture through Aboriginal music, which is oftentimes the most um, original form of music. So we had Aboriginal and African music. And actually, uh, from our experience, we realized parents didn't really like to sign up to this module. Most of them signed up to the classical music modules, perhaps thinking that you know Aboriginal and African music is not so... Um, relatable or also so relevant in Hong Kong context. But the students who actually joined the Aboriginal Obri and African music classes gave feedback that they really enjoyed those lessons because they could actually do it as a percussion base and they could actually perform. And we'll look at it later. Um, so we had a mix of uh, Aboriginal African music, classical music, and also the theatre music, um, and we actually uh, included even um, um, uh, comics like Tom and Jerry um, to show them how music actually complemented um, the storytelling. Next. Um, and very important, every lesson children get to participate for classical music. Of course, um, we didn't give them uh, uh, child size uh, instruments this time because uh, of the COVID situation. But going forward, uh, when the situation allows, we will actually distribute child size instruments for students to participate along. But for this particular session, um, uh, parents and students participated in the African uh, music ensemble. Let's play. So this um, um, very short performance came after an hour of playing with these drums and you can see the students applied tempo, they applied um, uh, rhythmic tunes, they even sang along afterwards. Um, and so I think it was a very good spiral learning experience where students not just learned the context and the theory, but they were actually able to apply. Um, next. So that was the music and immediately following one hour of music, students went on to do art. And this is where the interdisciplinary level also came to play. Um, so with uh, the music and we talked about four seasons and how music were able to portray the different four seasons, uh, we actually got them to do it in art. Um, and one of the lessons taught, uh, taught them about how classical music is inspired by insects. And we played the flight of bumblebee. Um, and in art, they, 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 they made a 3D um, artwork um, uh, featuring bees. Um, the, uh, and with the Aboriginal music, we did um, an antelope a head 3D uh, papier-mâché sculpture. What's really amazing, because my daughter participated in this uh, experience, is that they got to play with, if you look at all these artwork, cardboards, uh, paper, uh, sand, straws, glitter, and a lot and a lot of glue which at the beginning of the sessions, kids actually did not want to get their hands dirty, uh, but towards the end, they were all in it. So I think it's really breaking that mental barrier um, that whilst we need to stay safe and healthy and hygienic, how do we within a safe environment get them to still keep up that risk-taking, exploratory learning um, mentality and mindset. Next page. Um, yep, so the kids all participated, uh, the, the teachers were there uh, on hand to help. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, beyond getting their hands dirty and playing with all these mediums, they really had to follow instructions. Because if you um, did something wrong, you could actually do this 3D painting. 2D is quite different. If you paint it, you don't like it, you can paint over it. 
But with 3D, if you're stuck in the wrong place, you have to start again. So it really, really tested the patience. And after they got things a bit wrong a few times, they realized I really had to listen to the full instructions um, at the very beginning. And I think this is also something that has been missing over the past few uh, months of uh, working from home is that they don't get to work with peers that much, that much. And uh, that collaborative mindset and following instructions, playing your part, ensuring that, you know, we you do things together at the same pace. I think that was a really good um, a learning experience for children. And at the same time, when they left, they got their own individual product um, to prove um, the, the effective learning process. Um, next page. And, uh, and very interestingly, and uh, Joe will talk more about this, um, I initially thought some of these concepts were a little bit hard for children, but I realized actually they were able to grasp it and apply it. So, um, so in the lessons we taught, you know, what is the concept of symmetry? Drawing is not just by random um, drawing. And this is actually um, to, 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 to curate their uh, Aladdin magic pillow, which I don't get to share here. Um, so they learn about symmetry and how patterns are formed and what kind of patterns are natural, what kind of patterns are man-made. Um, so how do they, how can they create their own patterns based on observations? Um, and of course, as Dr. Wong said, you know, they should go hiking, they should go outdoors, but actually when they hike, then can they go and find leaves that, um, that give different patterns? Um, they can, can they find a different uh, shapes of leaves? Can they actually communicate to parents how these shapes are different? All this is integrating learning into the everyday experience and it's actually fun so with my daughter for example and she's actually the one on the left here um when we first started, went, when we went hiking um the first first few times it was only 15 20 minutes and she was like, oh, I'm very tired and towards the end she could do three four hours of hiking just by looking out for magic leaves and they use the leaves so we come home and we yes she use the leaves and make leaf art um so it's, it's, it's this kind of interdisciplinary learning that can um, be time efficient it's all done within the same time but at the same time kids get to learn in a fun way next page please um, so to, to, to summarize then, uh, we linked music and art together because we feel that this is very interdisciplinary linkable. And for music beyond just gen, uh, generic Disney basic instruments, we really expose them to a wide range of real instruments. Um, uh, show them how to appreciate music, not just genres, but also the history of how music comes about, how the different uh, musical instruments within the same family are different, just like mommy, daddy, and, and siblings. Um, and then through art beyond painting and 2D, they did a lot of exposure to different mediums. They create three, um, created 3D uh, um, products. They learn a little bit about art theory, and it's a lot of interdisciplinary inspiration in terms of themes. Um, next page. Yep. So in this August, we are um, uh, we have learned from the pilot experience, and we'll be doing a, a, an enhanced version of that program uh, in collaboration with Arch Education, that runs the overall curriculum structure and design. Um, Tom Lee, which will, who will actually provide us with professional instructors, and most interestingly, child size instruments. Art Loop, who will continue with uh, the art uh, uh, component of the teaching and also Victoria Play Park offering a child-friendly environment. Um, Hong Kong Philharmonic musicians will still come in to do ensemble performances, but not every lesson, but at the very beginning and the end. So in the middle, kids can actually try out the instruments themselves. Um, and towards the end of the year, of the whole, whole three, four months module, students will get the opportunity to perform on stage with these um, world-class music, uh, musical instruments They are uh, musicians. They will not be able to perform these music pieces, but actually just being on stage and in the presence of making music uh, will itself be uh, very inspiring. Um, next page. So here um, we invited uh, Demi, who is uh, our key coordinator with the Hong Kong Philharmonic Musicians to share a little bit about her experience uh, learning music and why she uh, is so eager to participate with us to deliver this unique experience. Please play the video. Hello, 
呃，因为前段时间我们做了一轮啊、呃、音乐课程，是跟香港管弦乐团十二位乐师一起合作的。那在这里，我想跟大家分享一下，为什么我们要做一个 professional 的一个嗯、呃、一个课程呢？因为通常大家带来到音乐厅都是很远距离的看啊、呃、音乐会，那我们这个课程呢是把我们所有在舞台上的每一件乐器啊、呃、分别挑出来为小朋友们做一个很详细的介绍，并且让大家能够感受到每一样乐器它们之间的 connection。那关于为什么我们要做这样一个课程？因为呃，像古典音乐，其实特别像我们呃做管弦乐呃演奏的乐师来说，呃，其实合作是很重要的一环呃，一个环节吧。嗯、呃，其实，在我们生活中，不光是音乐，在呃很多很多事情上，我们都需要一定的合作。那我们也想通过音乐的形式，嗯、呃，给小朋友们介绍一下，嗯、呃。乐器之间和乐师之间，他们是怎么合作的？啊、呃，那合作出来的效果又是什么 ？Which is 对我们将来小朋友们这个合作的意识，我觉得也是一个非常重要的一门课程。那肯定有很多爸爸妈妈有一个疑问，就是怎么样才能做到这个 professional 呢？啊、呃，我相信啊、呃，你们的小朋友现在吧，如今很多小朋友都有多多少少都有学一件，甚至于两件乐器。嗯，那么怎么样把它提高到很高的一个程度呢？嗯，当然一定是练习是最重要的了。当然，这是不光是学音乐了。那像我们啊、呃，搞专业的，嗯，从小第一，我们从小就开始学了。就是从很小的年龄就开始了，那么特别是弦乐，这个 family 的这些乐器，嗯、um, ，还有一个就是可能需要多多感受一些这个古典音乐带给我们的一些啊、嗯、一些感受吧，就是那些场合我们会多去一点这样子，嗯，这样呢我们就可以嗯能够从中得到很多的启发。Yeah, the reason we insisted that we have these professional performers to join us is because performers and teachers are quite different. Teachers can relate to students, but performers have that flair and that、uh, adaptability to perform anything on spot. So,、um, which is great experience. 